Oh boy. Hi, boy. You. <laughs> I expect to see you here. So. <laughs> Are we ready? Are we ready? So, uh, hello and welcome everyone to this uh, summer term LSC Miguel Dolls Fellows Lecture of the Canela Blanche uh, Foundation. And um, we have six uh, visiting fellows, uh, five of which are going to be intervening directly in person. And Costanta, because uh, there has been some bereavement in the family, is going to do it in. Uh, online so um we got six fellows so 20 minutes maximum because we all want to finish and go for dinner afterwards to celebrate uh, the summer term um and there would be 15 minutes for the presentation so be concise and followed by questions from the audience and comments uh, by myself so without further ado Professor at the University of Alcala, specialized in the field of uh, applied economic analysis, who is going to be talking about the negative impact of TCA on trade. So remember, you have 15 minutes and then we'll ask questions. Right. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank Canada Arts Center for offering us the opportunity to present our work and inviting us to LSC. It's a great opportunity. So uh, thank you, Andres, especially Andres Rodriguez Fosset for giving us this opportunity. But I will not uh, use more time. I go directly to the, to the paper that I would like to present. In fact, it is not a paper. It is like a research project. Right now we have a paper. And now, meanwhile, I will be here in LSE. I will work in a different paper, OK? so. The question is, if you are interested on in what is going on with the Brexit, what has happened after the UK leaving the European Union common market, uh, this is your paper, okay? This is your, stay here at least for five minutes. Okay, everybody knows what has happened in, um, with Brexit, okay? On January the 1st in 2021, the UK left the European Union. The, uh, so uh, the, the trade and cooperation agreement uh, started to regulate the, all the transactions between European yeah. Union and UK, okay? The trade and cooperation agreement, TCA, do not include tariffs for those products that are produced within Europe or within UK. But even that, we observe that there are some trade costs that affect trade, like you have custom related costs, administrative costs, for instance, or you have to pay value added taxes in advance. Uh, in the previous systems, at the end of the whole process or the whole export, you were paying value added tax, tax. Now you have to pay in the customer. For instance, you have the logistics costs. It takes more time. Maybe you have you may have delays, and uh, you also have additional requirements related with packaging and, and other things. Okay, and finally, uh, you do have to uh, certificate that you are uh, according, your product is according with rules of origin or technical barriers or sanitary uh, requirements. So if it is the case, uh, what we are going to do? Okay, we are going to use the, all the transactions from the Spanish firms and we have information about the product, the region, the amount, and um, uh, the country of this trade from Spain to any other to any other country in the world. And we have all the transactions. And we are going to choose this data with this technique. This is an event study uh, work. Uh, and in this event study, it's like 
difference in different approach. So we are comparing what has happened in the UK with what, what has happened in a different country like, for instance, France or United States, okay? And the results uh, is the, are the following. First, the trade between UK and Spain decreased substantially. In fact, export decreased about 23%. And imports, Spanish imports from UK decreased by 27%. We also observe uh, that the effect is mainly provoked by the TCA. Previous to the trade and cooperation agreement, we also have a lot of uncertainty. And there are some papers that claims that this uncertainty is bad for trade. Right, this is true. But the main impact is on the trade and cooperation agreement. Third, uh, we also observe that rules of origin, uh, the product has to be produced here in the United Kingdom in order to be exported with zero tariffs to Spain. These rules of origin uh, create also a barrier and it, they have a cost. And we observe that the Spanish import prices increases by 8%, but if you are using these rules of origin, you can decrease this price increase by 3%. It's lower by 3%. Okay, so we are going uh, to, to talk about this uh, in case that uh, you are not interested anymore in what I explained. This is my paper and now the details. Okay, I'm not going to go through all the details. I just uh, will uh, comment several things about trading paths, the cost in prices and some, some results. Okay, previous literature, uh, mainly Fernandez and Winters only, and Green and Lowest, I'm not going to detail all of this literature consider that Brexit reduced trade between UK and uh, European Union. This is uh, quite well established. But we have another paper from Friedman, Manuba, Breyer, and Samson, uh, Central of Economic uh, Performance here in the United Kingdom, that uh, argue that Brexit. Uh, so a positive impact on export from UK to the European Union. So it's the opposite result. And uh, imports from U uh, from UK imports from European Union uh, declined significantly. So no effect on exports, UK exports, but a decline uh, on uh, UK imports. Okay, and this is very strange. This is the motivation of our paper, uh, and uh, it appeared this last paper in meanwhile we were working on this. Okay, uh, the even study the diff and diff is a methodology that explains one variable in this case trade. Trade can be export of imports, trade. And you have the events. The events is a dummy variable multiplied by UK for each quarter during the whole period that we analyze. The whole period is one year before referendum to uh, uh, 2021, 22, sorry. Uh, so this is the variable that we are interested in, okay? The dummy variables for the effect of UK on trade, on export and imports. And we control for a firm, product, and country uh, variables. This is a dummy variable, firm, product, and time. Okay? And we have additional, like we have a rate and GDP uh, controls. Okay? And so what I'm going to present now is this D variable, the estimation for this variable. And this is what we observe uh, in, in for Spanish export to UK, UK. We observe that previous to the referendum, there was not a pen. Normals around zero. After the referendum, there is a decrease. 
mostly of this uh, uh, is significant below zero, and uh, that it means that rate decreases uh, with uh, between Spain and UK, but we observe a sudden decrease after the TCA, or after the 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 really fact that the UK or leave the United uh, United Kingdom leave European Union. Okay, so this is the main result. Uncertainty is important, but it's not so important as the okay the new trade barriers that appear with the TCA. And for imports, Spanish imports from the United Kingdom, we observe more or less the same a decreased negative impact during the whole period, but especially at the end of the the period when TCA entry into force. And this is the, the estimation. As you can see here, we have three different periods. Previous to the referendum is the, 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 the reference period. Then we have uh, one period in which we, there were negotiations and there was problems and, and the entrance into force of the TCA was delayed. And finally, the TCA uh, 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 entry uh, into force, and this is first period, second period, third period, and previous the reference periods. And this is what we do here. Instead of one dummy for each quarter, we collect all the dummies uh, for the post referendum period and all the dummies for the TCA period. And what it means is that the, the effect is 0 0.3, that it to make the the appropriate transformation, it means about 23% of decrease in trade as a consequence of the TCA. Okay, this is a, a paper. The paper has more things like uh, exit entry of firms into these markets, like uh, more detail about uh, phytosanitary uh, uh, problems, rules of origin, but uh, I would like to comment on what I am working here right now that is related with the cost of preparation agreements, okay? Usually, uh, trade literature focus on integration. This is the first case of disintegration, okay? And one important question is, uh, what is the cost that even the preferential trade agreements introduce? Uh, because they have rules of origin. What are the cause of these rules of origin? Okay, we are moving from no rules of origin to a context in which we have rules of origin. So this is what we are going to do. We are going to take a look of prices. The literature says that the, 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 the rules of origin cost is about 3.5, 3, from 3 to 5% of the total goods traded. And this is a figure that presents the evolution of prices for uh, products that the comp Spanish company buy from France and UK. Okay, as you can observe, the evolution is quite similar during the whole period, but suddenly, as expected, we have two uh, facts here. First, France increased prices, and this is inflation. We have shared a quite a sudden and important uh, rise on inflation during uh, 20, 21st and uh, 2021 and 2022. But the uh, price increase in UK was much higher. So how we can explain that? We can explain that because we have a new trade agreement. Okay, and we follow a similar methodology. In this case, the, we are looking at prices, and this is the event in 2021, UK left European Union, and some transactions now, some not all transactions use preference. Okay, so they have to present documentation about uh, this preference. Uh, in this present preference, because in another case, they have to pay the most favored nation tariff, okay? 
So this is the cost that we want to measure. It's just the same methodology. We have a fixed pets related with firm, product, country, and mode of trade with and without preference, and so on, because we have some other countries in, in that trade with Europe that also use preference, okay? And we are interested on beta one and beta two, and uh, this is the results, that's a brief summary of the results. It said that uh, the price increase is about 8%, but when you are using preference, you use preference, uh, the, the, the price increase is a little bit lower, it's only the difference between 8.5 minus 0 0.3, uh, this is only 5% increase. Okay, they use the preference and save 3%. Yeah? But the cost of preference, we can say that the cost of using preference is about uh, 3%. The, the problem right now uh, I'm thinking about is that the decision of the company about the price and the use of preference or not use of preference is simultaneous. So I have, I, I, we have to include a kind of uh, instrumental variable or uh, any system that I'll, can control for that. I don't, I'm not sure what to do right now. I'm working on that. It could be instrumental variable or simultaneous equations or something like that. Okay, and this is all. Uh, uh, this is all. The, the, the work we are doing here is about Brexit, about the impact of trade, and what we have shared is that the withdrawal of UK uh, introduced a cost, significant cost in prices, reduced trade, and uh, in conclusion, we, we can say that uh, we need deep integration if we, we want uh, to, to, to benefit for all the uh, reductions of trade agreements can introduce. Okay, thank you very much. I have more information, but I think I, I, I need to. I think it's good. Thank you very much, Juan Jose. So, comments from anyone in the audience? I was thinking that if you have a control for the behavior of multinational firms, those firms that uh, have different uh, yeah. headquarters in the UK and the European countries, if this could impact your model in some way. Okay, uh, any firm characteristic is included in the fixed effect. Okay. When we include this, uh, uh, you, in, you, 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 you are saying that this firm is multinational, it's local, and in fact, when you include foreign and time effects, you can uh, control for any sort of productivity, any change within the farm, like uh, the main the manager uh, leaving the company, this sort of thing. So uh, we control for that through the fixed effects. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, uh, this is not my topic of study at all, but even with that, I wasn't surprised by finding the results. So I was wondering how are you gonna, I mean, like, yeah, there is Brexit, so of course there is a decline. So um, some more about the justification of the paper or, or, or the the kind of the surprise in the motivation, I think over there. I'm not sure that it's so clear here mm -hmm. in the United Kingdom that the, there is a precedent, so there is a decline on this one. Okay. Um, uh, in fact, uh, the, this paper, uh, Say the opposite. This is a British paper and say that they have a positive impact on export from UK. Uh, okay. yeah, positive. Is, is the model the model in a strategy different? Uh, are they not using diff in diff? Why? It, the, the strategy is similar and the, the problem it might be in the data they are using. Okay. Uh, this is the, the work of Trina Lovelace. Uh, they, they mix different data and they try to, to, to show that these results are biased by the use of a specific data. Uh, so uh, 
And one question is, okay, we might expect that is negative, but what's the, the side of this impact? But in our paper is not only about that. What is more important, uncertainty for companies or real cost? Okay. When you are certain, certain, sure that you have to pay this cost for trade. Okay, this is all about this, the paper. And, and then we, we have strategies from the companies that we also talk about in the paper, like we are going to exit, we are going to entry, we are going to move instead to the United Kingdom anymore. Let's go to, to, to France or to uh, United States, these sort of things. So I, 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 I try to summarize the content of the document just to maybe some of you want to read it. Any other questions? If not, it's my time to say very interesting uh, paper of policy. Um, two things. Um, the first one is we've been told that in the past that companies prepare in anticipation of events. That uh, when you have a referendum, you might not know what's going to happen. You might not know how big Brexit is going to go. But you have different stages, which first herald the idea of we're going to have a hard Brexit. And then you close the agreement, you put a date, and nothing happens because it's more or less stable until you implement the trade agreement. Why is that? Is it companies that are not adapting or are not realizing what's going to happen? Yes, yes. This is, my, this is my blame, probably, because I haven't explained properly all the information that are within this, but thank you for the question because it gives me the opportunity to explain some things. Okay, I say that the, 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 the TCA was postponed twice. First, it was postponed about this date, and second, about this date. And previous to that, we observed an increase. Like, it seems like anticipation from France. Okay. Uh, we are, it would be difficult for us to export afterwards. So we are going to increase our export and we observe that here. Okay, so this is why this huge increase compensates in some sense from my perspective with this uh, increase. Maybe it should be something like that, but as a lot of export wars said to the United Kingdom in advance, yeah. but uh, Uncertainty is in this period. Now we are certain, we are sure that we have these new rules and uncertainty affects also, but not so much as the real cost that we serve when the treatment uh, enter into force. And then the second question is, well, you find the other authors have found an, an impact of 20% decline for the whole of the EU. You find that in the case of Spain is 23%. Uh, we always were under the impression that Spain was going to be a bit more sheltered because it was more complementary, not a direct competitor. But who is suffering the most? Is it British companies? Is it Spanish companies? Or is it altogether more or less in the same way? Uh, I think uh, this is another telling question. The last paper uh, in farm level data, they use aggregate data, uh, uh, sectoral data. And you have a detailed comparison of all the countries. And uh, the answer to your question from my perspective, from what I know, is that the one that more that suffer more is the United Kingdom, because they uh, all the companies are obliged to follow the new trade, uh, trade agreement within uh, United Kingdom and European Union. Meanwhile, Spanish companies try to uh, find an, a different way uh, to avoid this treatment. They move to a different country, so they are not affected because of that. Okay, so in that perspective, the, the biggest impact are for for genetic, for you guys in your Okay, thank you very much, Jose. Thank you very much. Now we're moving on to our online presentation by Costanza. Hello, good afternoon. Can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, now we can hear you uh, loud and clear. So first of all, my condolences uh, uh, to you. Um, and we hope to see you uh, whenever you can uh, back in the UK. 
Uh, you. So, uh, you know the rules. So you have 15 minutes that will be followed by a uh, presentation. And I must say one thing to Juan Jose and to Constanza. When you're coming here, it's mainly to not to present finished work, just to develop new projects and present the projects like what you're doing and Constanza is going to do. What is going to do? So Constanza Gianantoni, she is at the Department of Economics and Law at the Sapienza University of Rome, and she's going to be talking about the issues of gender equality in Europe. So Constanza, you have 15 minutes. 15 minutes, sorry. 15, okay. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to present this uh, very preliminary work I've been working on in the very last few weeks. So this is my London research. Um, it is about the gender equality in Europe. It, it is a new topic for me. Um, and I specifically, I want to study uh, the effect of uh, regional institutions and of political vote uh, across the European regions. Um, the, there is a growing interest uh, in, uh, in, in the issue of gender equality, which is an issue that has many aspects. Um, some of them, uh, just to mention some of them, uh, there is the aspect of female participation and female access to labor market, um, the aspect of gender employment gap, as well as, as the gender pay gap, which is a, which are very uh, distinct aspects of the of gender equality, um, and also, for example, the um, the dynamics of uh, fertility rates. And there is uh, we we have evidence, and I will provide you a picture of these uh, of these uh, evidence uh, of. Uh, um, heterogeneous patterns uh, of uh, female employment uh, and uh, fertility rates, for example, across uh, European regions. But despite these uh, evidence, um, we don't have many studies uh, um, on gender equality um, from a regional perspectives, uh, a regional perspective. And this is due, in my opinion, especially um, to the lackness of uh, data of the, uh, at the regional level on these, uh, on these outcomes, uh, on these issues. And when we have uh, uh, this kind of data, we have a very short time perspective. Um, so I would say that the, the interest uh, in the regional aspects of gender equality is very recent. But you, you may ask uh, why it is important to take into account gender equality. Uh, of course, uh, from a um, political science point of view, it is a prerequisite for democracy. Um, it is a fundamental right to deliver equal opportunities also um, in terms of rights, uh, in terms of uh, economic outcomes and economic opportunities. And is also a prerequisite for um, sustainable development for the progress uh, um, in social democratic uh, aspects, in economic aspects. If we are concerned uh, um, with uh, the regional competitiveness, uh, then um, the, the, the women contribution matters uh, a lot because if women uh, mm, share um, the same uh, opportunities uh, in uh, in uh, labor market participation, in uh, entrepreneurial participation, in education, they can actually uh, contribute in increasing uh, uh, knowledge in the economy. Uh, and these, of course, might have an impact on the productivity at the regional level, on the regional competitiveness, on many economic out outcomes at the regional level. And this is something that have been recognized recently uh, by the European Commission. Um, I would say that the the women's uh, uh, empowerment uh, um, and, uh, and and participation in the economy can can also be important uh, uh, for the progress of the less developed region. And uh, as as I said, the European Commission. Uh, um is taking this into account uh, as the 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 very recent program of the European Commission cohesion policy um delivers 30% of all the investment in supporting gender equality um but as uh, as i mentioned before um we do not know a lot of the regional dynamics of gender equality 
uh, and for for the for the likeness of data uh, that I mentioned before here um, I focus um, I would focus mainly on the regional female employment rate and uh, on on regional fertility rates in the next weeks uh, as I said before this is a a, a very recent work I've been working on this uh, on this topic in the in the last few weeks so I have many things to do and I want to uh, I would I will deepen the analysis on the um, female achievement index and on the disadvantage index and these are two indices which are have been recently um, developed by the the European Commission but they they draw back um, is derived from the fact that they refer just to 2021. And this is because uh, the the interest on this topic is very recent. Um, but I I really think that it would be useful to include uh, um, these two indices in the analysis. Uh, oh, okay. So my um, I'm interested in un in understanding the link between. Uh, uh, regional development, uh, regional institutions, and gender equality. Um, this is, um, let's say that gender equality, um, th there is a, a, well, a very uh, well-established uh, strand of literature which studied uh, gender equality and, and keeps studying uh, gender equality from an individual point of view, from the point of view of firms. Uh, uh, but I think that there is, um, there is still... Um, room there is still much to say uh, about uh, regional institutions and their impact uh, on uh, um, gender equality um, and i think that regional institutions uh, um, have a, a a great importance uh, in determining uh, differences uh, in a local labor market structure for example uh, of course affecting female employment and uh, fertility rates and i also uh, uh, i'm i'm really interested in uh, understanding uh, the the association between electoral outcomes and gender equality um for example one one possible uh, question could be which is the association between if there is a, an association on effect of uh, female participation in labor market and political participation from a broader point of view so uh, I mentioned before the heterogeneity in the patterns of uh, uh, female employment rate and fertility rate. Uh, um, I was telling the truth. So here you can see that actually mm, these two these two outcomes are um, are um, have very mm, different patterns across the European regions. Um, the, the the first panel is referred to the institutional quality index. Um, distribution across the European regions, uh, which uh, which I uh, which I take into account into the an this analysis. These are not all uh, the European countries. Um, I gathered uh, data uh, at the NATS2 level for 13 European countries. Uh, there are no full data coverage for all uh, for all the regions across uh, Europe, unfortunately. Um, and I, uh, I include in, into the analysis both economic and social demographic variables uh, for a period spanning 2010-2019, uh, covering uh, a total of 174 European regions. Uh, and I include both uh, variables at the regional level and at the country level. So in many specifications of, uh, of the model, uh, I, I consider as dependent variables the familiar employment rate, the fertility rate, and in the next weeks, uh, I, will, um, I will include the, the, two, the two indices by, uh, developed by the European Commission. And uh, um, as a main explanatory variable, I'm mostly interested in assessing the effect of uh, institutional uh, quality index and of political turnout. So uh, I'm sure I don't have to explain you what is a female employment rate and what is a fertility rate. Uh, maybe some words can be spent on the female, female achievement index, um, which uh, ranges from zero to 100 and measures the level of, um, of female achievement and is compared to the best regional female performance. 
uh, while the female disadvantages index measures the, the, the um, compares, let's say, uh, female disadvantage with respect to the men disadvantage, comparing uh, um, if women are doing worse than men in the same region. And then the European Quality of Government Index is the well-famous um, index developed by the University of Gothenburg, and is, it is based on uh, three pillars about uh, impartiality and level of corruption in many aspects of public life, such as education, public health care, and law enforcement. So this is the the the. the equation that I that I estimated uh, I take into account as the dependent variable the um, regional gender outcome at time t plus one uh, the main explanatory variable uh, the coefficient in which I'm interested is uh, beta one and it refers to the effect of the normalized regional institutional quality index I include in the in the final specification both uh, regional specific control and country specific controls, then time fixed effects, uh, and the, the model uh, the panel is estimated uh, with uh, also with the region fixed effects. Uh, regional controls include, uh, of course, the lagged values of the dependent variable, GDP, population, a proxy for human capital. Uh, the total number of um, people aged between 20 and 29 employed, the total employment, uh, number of death and life expectancy. And in the final specification, I also include country, con country levels control, uh, controls including uh, Gini index, uh, brain drain, uh, and most importantly, the number of female part-time contracts and temporary contracts. Uh, so, Mm, here I sum up the, the, the first results, the preliminary results that I get. Uh, mm, the, first column, the first two columns uh, refer to the model, which does not include the country levels con level controls. Uh, um, the last two columns uh, uh, refer to the model, which include the country level controls. And the final column um includes also the year and region fixed effects so i will give you i will comment with you just this uh, last column which is telling us that um, we we get an effect a very significant and quite important in magnitude effect of the uh, regional institutions if we are happy with the um, with the institutional quality index proxying uh, regional institutions so, so Mm, these institutions matter in uh, determining the female employment rate at T plus one. Uh, and what I find interesting uh, is this association with part-time contracts and temporary contracts. These, mm, these coefficients are telling us that the, the female employment rate, uh, let's say that the female employment uh, is probably mm, not a very good employment. Uh, so we have this association with part-time and with temporary contracts. So in a, in a way, probably um, there is room for improvement for the, the kind of employment of women. And if we turn to the, this uh, different table, which is um, specular in the structure to the one that I showed you before, but this time we have as a dependent variable, the fertility rate. We see again that regional institutions have a, a great impact uh, on, these, uh, on the fertility rates, but also that young employment becomes uh, very, very relevant in explaining uh, uh, the fertility rate dynamics. And so that if uh, women and men as well are employed when, when they are, at the early stage of their lives, uh, um, they this can actually have a, a, a good impact on the fertility rate. Part time, uh, the, the part time contracts for women also um, are strongly uh, associated with uh, the fertility rates. So part time uh, for women, um, let's say, induces women maybe in having more uh, more children, while this, this result is also really interesting because um, temporary contract um, 
they are, for for women are not a good incentive for uh, for fertility rates and so for demographic for demographic uh, oof, demographic I'm sorry uh, purposes. Uh, and I think that these two variables uh, are adding a lot on the on this on this analysis. Um, so on on the next week, next steps for this research. Uh, but I will be happy if uh, if also uh, from audience you will give me some hints from some ideas to to improve this work in the next in the next weeks. Uh, um, I'm thinking in deepening in deepening the analysis on the. Um, female disadvantage and female uh, achievement indices and I also want to include the as I was saying before the um, political vote dimension uh, to uh, first of all investigate if there is uh, an interacting role of regional institutions and electoral results uh, uh, in let's say in in affecting uh, uh, the gender gap in affecting uh, uh, female participation in labor market if uh, uh, I, I still don't know if uh, it, it, it increases or it, it decreases, but I, I also uh, want to, to investigate the, um, the, the possible effect of um, or our association or, or uh, joint dynamics of uh, female participation in labor market, female participation in the economy and um, political participation because I think that this um, could also give some interesting insights on the on the gender issues mm, so I, I really thank you for the attention and again if you want to give me ideas or feedbacks I would be very 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 happy to share them with you okay, thank you very much Chris. all right comments and questions we'd like to ask Yes, go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, I have a question. It's about you have a lot of country variables, but uh, have you considered that the education level of employment for female and male on that issue? Sorry, we get she probably not hear you. you. You have to talk louder, Georgie. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Could you hear her? I heard something about the, <laughs> the, the human capital, but I, I, I didn't get the verb, so. So, uh, my question is, uh, you have a lot of country variables uh, for the country level or regional level, but you have you considered that uh, education level for the female empl employment? I, I'm, I added in, uh, in the controls the human capital, so the share of people having tertiary education. I, uh, I, I don't know if I uh, if I'm getting um, wrong. Uh, I I can probably differentiate uh, among um, tertiary education for women and tertiary education for men. Uh, this is something that refers to to both me, men and women. So I can probably control for more specific variable of human capital uh, uh, directly referring to to women. If I'm replying yes. to your question. Any other questions? Yeah, I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, Constanza. Yeah, I have a question on the on the kind of lag that you are applying because I'm not mistaken, you are you are putting a lag of one year into the into the effects. I don't know if changing that lag kind of changes the results. Um, I don't know if it's a, it's a good question or not, but. Um, you're trying to regress the institutional on some outcomes, you may allow some time for it to change. I don't know. Maybe okay. we'll say yeah, yeah. Expansion. I don't know what, what kind of econometric is spitted for, for this, but I don't know, just a try. No, no, no. This is something I'm um, which I, I'm thinking on. Um let's say I I, I added a lag to try to uh, to control as much as I can for endogeneity issues. If I consider the um, all the variables in the same time, so also the dependent variable at t, uh, I get, I would say the same results, uh, even stronger effects and some, some, uh, some coefficients bigger in magnitude. But I agree with you that it could be really interesting to do a sort of um, 
let's say, a sort of impulse response function in the sense that I can estimate the, um, how can I say, um, time-specific coefficients uh, to see the effects, uh, the effect delayed in times. So the effect at t plus one, t plus three. Um, the, the drawback is that I don't have, uh, um, no, maybe I can, I can increase the, um, the time span of my data and so I can probably yes get more periods uh, of time so yeah I can I can definitely do that thank you anyone else okay thank you for your presentation Constanza very interesting I would like to learn a little bit more about uh, the effect of 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 uh, 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 fertility rate okay mm -hmm. uh, it's not, it is not clear for me uh, why fertility rate um, greater fertility rate is more equal or unequal and uh, by mm -hmm. the way i like the idea of equality more than the idea of inequality so i appreciate that for your presentation so uh, if you just take a look of what is going on in the world, we have shared that a more rich country, probably more equal country, had mm -hmm. lower fertility rate. But your results are pointing out uh, the, the opposite, uh, and I like it. Would you try to explain to me, please? Yes, thank you very much for your question, because when I was I, I started uh, working on, on these, I, I, I also asked myself, uh, is a higher fertility rate good or bad? Mm, but I think that if we restrict the analysis at the European level, uh, of course, the picture changes a lot if you consider, if you are considering the developing countries or well-developed countries. And in Europe, we, we have a demographic problem. We have very low, low fertility rates, which are decreasing over time. I think that uh, let's say that if if we are concerned with the problem that women are not um, um, are not put in good conditions for having children, so you know maybe th this this kind of of analysis can can make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, um, I'm not ha arguing that having an impressive amount of children is good for a woman because of course this prevents her participation to 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 labor market so this uh, this is a controversial topic uh, i agree with you probably i should uh, i should study i should study it more from a let's say um, sociological perspective i should deepen i i agree with you that this is controversial thank you thank you Mm -hmm. uh, the clarification. Thank you. Okay, so um, my comments uh, to yeah. you. Uh, first thing, is, uh, I think it's a very interesting topic, and I'm just going to go to the nitty gritty that has highlighted. I think uh, your Ying highlighted the idea that, um, well, your results for um, education and human capital are not very significant. So yeah. maybe you need to focus on female human capital, because what we're interested in is, uh, is the education of women, does it lead to better outcomes in the labor market, not whether more men are educated. So probably you want to focus on that. Um, there has been the highlight by Victor of uh, do we want more time lags or not? You can experiment with different ones. Mm -hmm. My impression is your coefficients are highly robust. It's not going to change, and especially because institutional quality as well as education does not change massively from one year to the other within countries. But experimenting, I don't think there's putting the effort of making your time uh, series longer is going to be probably very important and the results are going to be limited. Try to experiment with one lag, two lags, three lags and see mm -hmm. if you get anything different. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the most important part is where I think Juan Jose was hinting at, mm -hmm. which also is how you're framing the paper. I think that the way you frame the paper at the beginning is, and forgive me if I sound harsh, a bit weak. So the mm -hmm. idea is uh, quality of government is, uh, is important and we get a correlation. But the question is, what are the mechanisms? Mm -hmm. Why should quality of government, or let's say you highlighted electoral turnout, and I'm going to go back to that in a moment, mm -hmm. should be important for that. 
And here's the quiz. Um, you have two, at the moment, key independent variables. And I'm, uh, sorry, key dependent variables. I'll be hesitant that you introduce more others. Why? Although I think the idea of having some sort of female achievement is, is important, but you're going to probably muddy a bit the waters in this paper. You can use it for another paper, you can use it as a paper in itself, and we can talk about that later. But you have two variables that are important. One is women in the labor force and the capacity of women to have children, fertility rates, mm -hmm. which in some perceptions are mutually exclusive. Either you work or you have children, but you cannot have both. But of course, the situation across Europe is very different. And you can have a situation whereby you have women that are active in the labor force and have children. Where does this happen? These are the Nordic countries. And those are the ones with the greatest equality. You can have women who work, but don't have children. And uh, I'm a bit, you, you're concerned about having a lot of children. In Europe, the variation is in fertility rates is between 1.1, 1.2, Bulgaria, and 2.2, 2.3, which is the replacement rate. We're not talking about a massive number of children, and that's France or, or Sweden or Norway. And you don't have Norway. So I'm not concerned about that. But um, you have the situation where women work but don't have children. That's mainly the case of Spain or the case of Italy, in which, mm -hmm. therefore, one excludes the other. You have to choose yeah. and you have possibility. You have other situations which are the more traditional where you have children, but you don't work. And it's less, I know, I, I'm not going to mention countries, but I know where you can have some. Mm -hmm. And you'll have a situation where you don't work or you don't have children. So the idea is, and this is where it's interesting, how do you create a system, a situation, whereby women don't have to choose to have children or work, but they can have both. And that's a, And my advice would be, go and look into the literature that have, has been coming from sociology, mm -hmm. mainly on the different welfare regimes. And especially the work by Justice Spin Anderson on families, fertility that he has been doing, and also uh, uh, since the late 1990s on that. And I think that would help you justify very much what you're trying to do. Then I have a concern, and I have a serious concern about why does turnout actually affect in any way uh, this whole idea of greater fertility or employment? You might want to take a look more than at turnout at the type of vote. Who do they vote for? Are they voting for parties with more traditional values that women should be at home and have children? Or are they voting for parties that are far more in favor of, uh, let's say, equality. And that's where you might want, rather than where they vote, we vote a lot or not, is do we vote for parties that are supporting more traditional values? Or are we voting for parties that support more equality? And if you do that, you'll have probably results that go in line to what you're getting here with quality of government. Thank you very much, yeah. All very, very useful comments. Yeah. Do you have any reply, quick reply? So yeah, um, I would be interested in, ex uh, let's say, um, I had the feeling that I that I really have to to deepen my knowledge on on this uh, literature, uh, sociology literature about the the welfare regimes because uh, I had the feeling that I. I let's say that I had difficult troubles in, in telling a good story about the, the relationship between female employment and, and fertility rates. Uh, I, I wanted to be, I want to be sure, I should be uh, sure um, about this story and um, about the, um, yeah, the political turnout. Um, yeah, you're totally right. That probably is not the good, the good aspect to look at. Um, I'm, I'm looking for the, for the, for the good data um, about the um, the support for um, more uh, egalitarian parties and more traditional traditional valued parties, uh, um, I had a look uh, on on this data, uh, but 
they just have uh, information about the anti-European parties. So probably that's why I didn't find uh, a, 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 an effect on these uh, on these outcomes. Uh, um, so yeah, um, I have a lot, lot of work to do, and I agree with you that I also have to focus more uh, in this in just these two aspects, and probably not taking into account so the, the the last two it. indices. You also have information about vote for extreme right wing parties. Yeah, extreme. It can help you. Many of them, not all of them. You have to look at what mm -hmm. they're doing, but they many of them have got more traditional views of, uh, let's say, the role of women. Mm -hmm. But I think that your story should be about uh, justifying the paper about this idea of how can women reconcile uh, work with having a family? How? What are the factors that actually facilitate this whole goal of on the one hand, pursuing full-time employment, because the idea of putting part-time and temporary employment, Netherlands is the world leader, well, not necessarily mm -hmm. world leader, but is, is the country in Europe with the biggest level of part-time employment. That might facilitate uh, childbearing, but doesn't actually allow women to progress in life. So you might want to say, how do you promote full-time employment and how do you promote higher fertility in the north and you might say the way should through be should through better institutions and this mm -hmm. is where you have a story that comes out very yeah, nicely I, but if you want we can talk about yeah, the type yeah, of literature I, that you might want to do it but i think the justification and the mechanisms for what you're doing and because the results are very interesting but at the moment you don't have a story to tell no no i i should uh, i should think better on the on how to how to study in a rigorous way this uh, transmission mechanism if if through subsamples if through interactions but yes you're you're totally right thank you very much okay well thank you very much and now we move quickly to um our next uh presenter so hao jang Yes, who is uh, from the University of Bristol and working on the geography of innovation. And he's going to be talking about the digital transition and the green transition and how they actually contribute to overconsumption with a focus on the UK. Hello, everyone, and thanks. Um, thanks for any discussion option. Um, yeah, today I'm going to introduce you with my uh, current research on um, green transition. The title is Does Digital Transition Contribute to Green Transition or Overconsumption in the Empirical Study in the UK? Um, yes, uh, climate change has has like exerted detrimental effects on or exerts detrimental effects on, on the well-being of individuals around the world. And we can see an increasing um, increasing number of catastroph catastrophic weather events recently. For instance, um, record-breaking ultra-high temperature in the UK last year, and frequent fierce storms, melting glaciers, and rising sea levels. And all these weather events have, have negative impacts on farmers and urban and coastal residents. So to combat to combat climate change, the uh, European Commission uh, published or released a, a, a report uh, of twin transitions in 2021. And then um, twin transition includes green transition, digital transition, and their interactions. Um, green transition means uh, facilitates um, like um, commercial activities to transform the production and consumption modes as energy as more energy efficient ones and digital transition uh, means for like individuals or organizations they could um like uh, be more efficient by um, by utilizing digitalization by ba based on digitalization for instance they share generate data share data online and they could also analyze patterns of big data for um uh, and then also disseminate information online and also like digital transition also influences green transition um one research finds that um like um artificial intelligence technologies have significant and positive effects on regional specialized further specialization in green tech if these regions are already specialized in green green technology and yes and then how do twin transitions work 
um, there are three aspects. The first one is green technology innovation, for instance, photovoltaics um, battery. The second aspect is green, uh, clean energy consumption, such as um, solar panels, um, wind power, and um, nuclear power. And, and the third one is industrial upgrades. As I said, um, like digitized companies utilize uh, digital platforms to, um, to, to analyze data and to for, for better like predictions and make better decisions. And in the context of UK, um, this figure indicates um, like a decreasing trend of carbon emissions, especially in energy supply, business and industrial processes. Uh, but carbon emissions um, remain unchanged in, in residential and transport um, sectors over the last three decades. And um, one explanation of the, of the decrease in trend in business and industrial processes could be about uh, could be changes of energy structure. For instance, um, according to um, like um, the 2022 digest of UK energy statistics, um, like um, a higher and higher proportion of clean and green energy were consumed in between like, for instance, 2010 to 2019. And also there's less and less intensive energy consumption. And the last expl explanation could be offshoring traditional industries such as um, coal, oil, and gas, which are uh, in, especially during two time periods. And then my research question is, but how is current digital transition associated with future green transition? And my research aims to investigate whether and to what extent digital transition contribute to green transition. Literature review. Um, digital transition influences green transition um, like by, by direct and indirect effects. For instance, um, direct effects include industrial productivity, um, energy efficiency, and carbon emissions. Um, like um, as for um, the direct effects, um, digitized companies could um, are able to like to utilize some um, digitized digitized digitalized digital technologies to improve their labor efficiencies. For instance, employees in these digitized uh, companies could are able to communicate with uh, suppliers and, and and consumers. Um, in a more efficient way, they could also, like as I said, they could also analyze data um, for better decision makings, and um, they could also um, utilize customized services provided by um, other internet companies. By doing so, they could decrease their energy inputs for the same amount of photo outputs. But however, there are also out, like there are also rebound effects that. Um, digital transitions could also increase total production and, and then total energy inputs. For instance, prices of intermediate and final products um, decrease if, if companies become more productive and to become like you um, become um, digitized. And then cost, customers' demands for these products tend to increase on two VOT prices reach an equilibrium point. Um, but like in some, the, like um, the more productive companies are, the more production and consumption society would be. And um, indirect effects include green technology innovation, um, energy structure and industrial upgrade. And there are also moderating effects. For instance, if spatial units or administrative boundaries have a higher levels of, um, like economic growth, for example, higher levels of GDP per capita and higher levels of human capital um, and more supportive policy in local institutions and public attitudes, then effects of digital transition on green transition may be different. Then um, my hypothesis is that digital transition has significant and positive effects on green transition. And this is my conceptual framework. As you can see um, at the left hand side, digital transition includes ICT infrastructure, ICT penetration, digital capacities. And at the right hand side, green transition includes um, greenhouse gas emissions, green total factor productivity. And then 
there, 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 is, there are direct effects and indirect effects and also moderating effects. This is my um, conceptual framework. In order to test my hypothesis, I conducted an empirical study in the UK at a local authority level between 2010 to 2019, especially in industrial and commercial sectors. And data sets which I used include greenhouse gas emissions, energy consumption by, by, by sectors and few types, and also regional gross value added by industry and uh, number of enterprises by a uh, broad industry group and taxes levied on climate change and environmental pollution. And also key statistics for local authorities is, um, for instance, highest qualifications of local populations and also population density. And the last data set is regional gross domestic, uh, regional GDP. And then I, based on these data, I created my variables in the same way. Um, so I would just explain how to how do I how did I default, how did I create the dependent variables? My dependent variables are change rates of industrial greenhouse gas emissions and change rates of commercial greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I like this variable is computed by taking the natural logarithm of dividing the average of industrial greenhouse gas emissions between 2010 to 2014, divided by the average between 2015 and 2019. The main point is the delta, um, delta log, and then the industrial, the average industrial greenhouse gas emission. And then it's, it's the same for the commercial one. And then the, the following three variables are my independent variables. The, the, the independent variable, the first one is ICT transition. Um, it's, it's calculated based on the average of gross value added in the information and communication sectors. And then the second independent variable is ICT enterprises based on the number of ICT enterprises. And the last one is clean energy rate for the industrial sector. Uh, I need to explain how I calculate this. I subtract the proportion of polluting fuels by one from one, and then I get the clean energy rate. And then I did the same to calculate, to, to compute the, the third independent variable, which is the clean rate, and also for the commercial sector. And then all the following variables are control variables. Um, for example, taxes, um, GDP per capita, gross value added in um, manufacturing and service in sectors, and also population density and human capital level. And then I, um, I, I adopted three like regression methods for the two for the two regression analysis. For instance, I adopted the OLS and ordinal logistic regression analysis for the regression of change rates of industrial greenhouse gas emissions. And then I adopted the OLS and spatial error models for the regression of change rates of commercial greenhouse gas emissions. Results, um, this figure in the, um, illustrates a decreasing trend of, of, um, of industrial greenhouse gas emissions over 16 years in the UK at a local authority level. And the average in rural areas decreased to a greater extent than that in urban areas. And then in my research, I mainly focus on the change between these two time periods. So between 2010 to 2014 and 2015 to 2019, between two time periods. And this figure also indicates a, a decreasing trend, but um, the average in urban areas decreased more considerably than that in rural areas for the commercial greenhouse gas emissions. And these maps illustrate where industrial greenhouse gas emissions, uh, greenhouse gas um, were emitted between 2010 to 2019. And most like um, high values are specially collocated in Yorkshire and the Humber and Northwest regions. While London, while low values are, are, are clustered in uh, greater London and Southeast regions. As for the commercial greenhouse gas emissions, um, high values are located in greater London and low values are in 
Wales, Southwest and East Midlands regions. And then these maps illustrate like the locations of my dependent variables, which is the change rates. Um, like um, long high values cluster in Greater London, which means that London or local local authorities in long, in Greater London changed industrial greenhouse gas emissions more considerably, and they cluster in this area. But there are no distinctive spatial patterns. No. But as for the commercial change rates of commercial greenhouse gas emissions, there are significant spatial patterns of autocorrelation of these change rates. For instance, um, Greater London, local authorities in Greater London and Southeast regions change the commercial greenhouse gas emissions to a greater extent, while Yorkshire, Northwest regions changed to a lesser extent. Then I, um, it, it's important to control the spatial lag effects of of these like these spatial patterns. Otherwise, um, like my estimated results would be inconsistent and in, inefficient. Okay, um, this table it, like indicates correlations between independent variables and dependent variables. Um, there are two significant variables correlations. One, one for clean energy rate, the other for taxes levied on climate change. Um, yeah, the first regression table indicates that the sixth model um, has the greatest explanatory power, and there are six um, like um, significant coefficients. But um, are these estimated coefficients robust? Then um, continuous values of the dependent variable are transformed as discrete discrete values such as rank. Then ordinal logistic regression is conducted, and the result found that the fifth model um, has the lowest AIC value, and there are four um, robust significant coefficients, um, including clean energy rate. GDP per capita and human capital lab levels of human capital. Um, then the results mean that if local authorities with high levels of um, clean energy rate, um, GDP per capita, and human capital, then um, industrial greenhouse gas emissions change to a greater extent in in the in the in the future, in the next time period. And I did the same regression analysis for the change rates of commercial commercial one, and um, results of the OLS regression um, like mean that there is there is an autocorrelation in the residuals. Then I need to control the spatial lag effects of the of the dependent variables or spatial lag effects of errors. Um, but according to like some statistic tasks. Spatial error model is, has, the, has the greatest expanded power, and there is only one significant variable, which is clean energy rate. So for the industrial, for the change rates of industrial greenhouse gas emissions, and for the commercial one, um, clean energy rates has significant and negative effects. So, but there, there is no difference of the estimated effects of the clean energy rates between urban and rural areas, no, there, there is no significant difference between rural and urban. Um, in some results fail to support my hypothesis and contradict contradict partly findings of other research in China and, and Europe. Discussion, um, digital transition does not affect green transition by improving industrial productivity, decreasing carbon emissions directly, or through the mechanism of energy structure and industrial upgrade indirectly. Uh, my explanation of this insignificant result is that um, like the time period may be too short. For, for instance, it, it, it may take a long time for, for the effects of digital transition on, on, the, on the change of like gr industrial greenhouse gas emissions or commercial greenhouse gas emissions um, to be significant enough then um then um 
digital transition should contribute to further green technology innovation. Um, like according to my the significant coefficient of clean energy rate. So um, it may it may not be appropriate to stop economic growth for, for coping with the issue of climate change, but should cooperate to develop new green technologies. Um, and yes, there are limitations. Um, um, my, we're going to have to cut it there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the, the first one, yeah. uh, the, the last one, sorry. Um, yeah. Finished. Do you have any questions? Yeah, do you have any questions? Yes, I bought you. Okay. Uh, what's the rationale when you're choosing for the ICP indicators? Rationale? Yeah. Um, oh, thanks. The yeah. ICT in, uh, interface and the different variables, the like, ICP one. Okay. Um, like, as I. Yeah, just. Uh, rationale, okay. Um, as I explained in my theory, um, like um, digital transitions have direct indirect effects on green transition. Um, for instance, like ICT, um, the main point is productivity, the improvement of productivity. Okay, um, ICT sectors um, are using like um, um, like information and communication technologies, which provide the entire society with 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 like internet services. And digital technologies. By using these kind of technologies, people are more likely to people are more, more likely to be, be productive, more productive, and to communicate more efficiently. And yes, by by doing that, we could we may decrease the energy input um, for the same amount of production outputs. That's that's the, that's what I um, like conclude in my uh, literature review part. And I'm not sure whether I explain your question well or not. You can ask some follow-up questions. For example, like uh, your data is about the uh, regional level data or the gross country, the country level data. Um, it's at the local authority level. Yeah, so it's like the yes. you the ICT the variables. That is, for example, you have the number of the the companies mm -hmm. yes. working in this industry. So that's also is the this level's data, right? Yes, all data are it's, it's at the local authority level. It's it's like a lower level of of regional level, lower level. Thanks for your question. Any other questions? Sorry, that was strong. Uh, and then my case, um yep, yeah, how uh thank you very much. I think it was a very interesting presentation, the only thing is you want to highlight that there might be a link between the digital transition and the green transition, and then you find no link. I mean, that's not necessarily bad. The problem is that when it comes to your conclusions, you still try to justify that what you're not finding might be happening because of other reasons. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have no link, you have no link. The question is what explains that no link or lack of link? And that's where you have to focus, uh, in my view, much more. Because are you trying to demonstrate that the previous literature that has highlighted that there is a link between, on the one hand, the technological transition, and on the other hand, the um, green transition is wrong, and then you, shaft, you need to focus much more on that? Or... Is it something that you're missing? Because also, it's not very clear to me, it's, uh, you have a lot of things there. Mm -hmm. But how do you measure the digital transition? Are those the best indicators that you're using to measure the digital transition? Yes. What are the, why are you using those? You have a, a, a digital transition measurement, you have a digital enterprise measurement, they reflect the past, but of course the transition might mean that the past might not count that much. So you have to reflect mainly about how you measure that, but also that your overall R squares are very low. I mean, very often I don't worry too much about R squares. You have a lot of indicators that are robust in your model, but you have very few indicators that are robust. Mm -hmm. So that's an indicator that, or a hint that you might have a lot of omitted variables. So what is it that you're missing? 
Is it a different story? Because you're not putting anything, if you were controlling for a lot of all the factors that locally actually affect the reduction of emissions, then that would be great. But you don't seem to be capturing those. So you need to think about how can I capture those? And then therefore, if I capture that connection between the factors, or do I, if I get the factors that actually reduce or contribute to the reduction of greenhouse emissions, do I get a different story linking digital transitions to the green transition? Yeah, yes, thank, thanks for your questions, um, especially for the for the last one. Yes, um, there could be a different story if I if I change the variables to another one. For example, um, like if I, I, I ignore the, the variables of like international trade and also ignore the change of industrial structures at different at, at, at diff, like across local authorities, these could be all for these these could be potential variables. And enough, and my 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 explan my explanation of of the low R, R square rates is 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 the lack of like is the lack of important variables, and then there are some limitations in my research. Yes, I agree, but I, I aggregate like I aggregate all values by averaging them, so I may. Um, this is just a cross section cross sectional analysis. So I I may like um, miss some really important information in the data. Not only in the data, but, but also I also ignore some other important potential variables. That's that's the main issues. And uh, and then my 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 third explanation my third explanation could be about um, the, the, the time period is 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 too. Too short for the for the effects start working. So I so in the next step I may focus on like how digital transition influence green tech innovation. So so um for instance um whether whether like the development of ICT sectors in 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 across local authorities influence green products influence green innovation at a local level. Yes, that that's, that could be my um. Like research direction in the next step. Okay. Well, we have to move on, but nevertheless, I think the the thing you have to you you come with a story that then doesn't prove to be true, and you're almost sorry that the story that you have disproven is not true. I mean, if you get no connection, you have to defend why you get no connection. But in order to do that, you have to be absolutely sure that your story, which is that the digital transition does not influence or does not affect the green transition is proof. And if you're telling me that, well, you're missing the right explanatory variables, you need to find us the right explanatory variables in order to make sure that your story is absolutely tight. And then you say, sorry, if we improve the digital transition, we're not going to have an impact on the green transition. But you have to be absolutely, you have to be absolutely sure that that's the story. Okay, thank you very much. So we're going to the next one. And the next one is uh, by Enrique Acebo, who is an assistant professor of management at the University of uh, Leon in Spain. And he's going to talk about whether climate change does promote environmental innovation. So Enrique, the floor is yours. So what? First of all, let me thank you, Andres, for having me here. It's a pleasure to present uh, this uh, working paper, which tries to um, answer this uh, important question: if uh, climate change promotes environmental in environmental innovation or not. So, first of all, I think that everyone agrees on the um, that climate change is one of the most important problems that we need to address as a society. And this climate change produce important uh, extreme events like uh, some uh, heat waves and uh, floodings. And I, when I was preparing this presentation, I, uh, in my mind, they uh, appear these uh, pictures from the last summer here in the UK, and especially in London when the we will see some uh, images like that of the Canadians of London, but this is not a unique event 
of the UK. This also have happened in other uh, parts of Europe. And as you can see during the, uh, in uh, 2018, but also in the following years, we have suffered some uh, heat waves and uh, extreme uh, high temperatures, mostly in the west part of Europe. But this climate change event has also produced super plus uh, rains in the Balkanic and Slavic countries. Ecological economics literature has pointed that these climate change events have a negative impact in the, at, at the regional and national level in terms of uh, economic losses that can vary, vary between uh, 100 euros per capita to more than 2,000 euros. So, we already know that this climate change has an impact, a negative impact at national level, but the important question is if it happened the same at micro level. And here it's important to ask yourself if there is any impact at the firm level, and this is a crucial question, uh, so important that the Community Innovation Survey have introduced this uh, question in their um, European a questionnaire asking firms to what extent some factor related to climate change have impact uh, their businesses. And here they are uh, thinking about changing in government rules, uh, changing in the uh, customer demands and uh, customer uh, behavior, but also direct impacts as uh, input prices, increases in the input prices, and also the negative impact produced by extreme weather conditions. So. Why, um, so regarding on, on this crucial question, we can um, think that there are two main theoretical backgrounds that support that to overcome this problem, this crucial problem for firms, firms uh, should introduce environmental innovation. And the first one is a organizational adaptation theory, which claims that to remain competitive, firm, firms mm -hmm. must need to adapt to this uh, volatility and new scenarios. And here, when we are talking about uh, climate change, and where uh, firms need to enhance their resilience to these extreme events, and here we are talking about heat waves or flowings that could uh, impact negatively in their supply chain, but also introduce new uh, business models uh, with a more sustainable orientation and to reconsider their risk management. Um, the, the, how they risk, how management they, they risk. But also there is an indirect effect. And here we are can uh, think about the institutional theory and uh, combine it with the psychological theory. Because in the psychological theory, it has been claimed that being exposure to climate uh, stream events reduce the psychological distance to climate change and this can produce some shifts in uh, the consumer of the in the behavior and the mindset of the consumers, uh, the individuals and, and their roles as consumers, uh, managers, and also policy makers and citizens. So regarding these two uh, theoretical backgrounds, we can see that to overcome this problem, firm should need to introduce environmental innovation. And what about well, what have found the previous literature about that. Well, in the, on one hand, we there are few studies which have focused on how uh, extreme climate events will impact directly uh, the decision of the firms to introduce environmental innovations or not. And here we have found some mixed results. Recently, Horvath and Kramer, using this uh, question of the community innovation survey, have found an, a small positive uh, side effect analyzing how German firms introduce uh, environmental innovation or not. Uh, but when um, Bon uh, Shifu have found more uh, contradictory results using patent data and uh, data at the national level. So here we claim that there are not a very clear result of the, this direct impact. But when we are talking about the direct impact that a, a consumer change behaviors, the, 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 the change of the, the the behavioral change of the consumers and the, the institutions of 
policymakers and new regulation, the literature claims that there is a positive effect. I mean, in the countries where a consumer have this green orientation, firms introduce more uh, environmental innovations, and also in those countries that have more uh, restrictive laws in terms of uh, carbon emissions, uh, firms decide to introduce uh, clean technologies. So regarding, uh, so relying on this uh, literature, I can build this conceptual framework in which climate change will have a direct impact on uh, the environmental decision of the firms, which uh, can be summarized in our hypothesis number one, the more a firm is affected by climate change, the more likely it will engage in environmental innovation, but there will be also a mediation path in which the environmental concern, if you have been exposed to a, a street climate event, your environmental concern will be higher and then you will, as cost consumer or a citizen, will demand that firms introduce this uh, environmental innovation. So to test this, uh, frame, this, con this conceptual framework, uh, we decided to use and uh, to apply a nonlinear mediation analysis, which can be described in these two equations. The first one, uh, uh, environmental concern, depends on the climate change event and some regional controls that I'm going to uh, explain later, and the environmental innovation, uh, depending on our treatment variable, climate change, the environment, environmental concern, our mediator, and some uh, controls at field level. We define uh, the first hypothesis, uh, the first equation as a linear regression, but the second one, because uh, the limitations of our data, because we only have binary, um, a, a binary dependent variable, we decide to use a probit model. So because we are using a private a probit model, we suffer the our model is not linear. So we cannot use the classical Baron and Kenyon approach. And then we have to apply the what is called the causal mediation analysis in which we have to decompose the total average effect in the uh, in one average casual mediation effect and another part, which is the direct effect. So to test this um, econometric model, we collect data from the Spanish version of the Community Innovation Survey to uh, build our dependent variable, which is a, 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 a dummy variable if the firm has introduced any innovation with the environmental purpose or reducing um, material waste or energy consumption. As mediator variable, we use the environmental concern of the region. Here we collect the data from the uh, Eurobarometer. And as treatment variables, we decide to use different measures of climate change. First, we decide to uh, analyze the impact of cold episode, cold, uh, heat waves and cold episodes, but also some extreme events related with uh, uh, climate change like floodings or wildfires. And as control variables at firm level, we use the standard ones used in environmental innovation literature, the firm's cooperation, the R&D expenses, the size of the firm, and some industry variables to control the technology. And at regional level, we use the GDP per capita, the population share with at least secondary education and employment rates, and the uh, urban region and the agriculture share of the region. So uh, what are the preliminary results of our uh, mediation analysis, uh, causal mediation analysis? Well, first of all, we find that the, uh, there is a mediation effect in terms of this environmental concern and a direct effect uh, uh, of the climate change when we are uh, analyzing heat episodes and these heat waves. So if you have been in a region who, which have suffered uh, a, one of these uh, heat waves, you are more concerned about climate change and friends also suffer this uh, negative impact. So there is a uh, and uh, the, the likelihood of the firms to introduce an environmental innovation is bigger. Although we have to say that the uh, total effect is, is small, it's just a, a 1% uh, 
Can you can you please explain what acne and AD uh, AD mean? Ah, uh, yeah, the, this is the average casual mediation effort, and this is the average direct effort. Yeah. Uh, and this is the total effort, which is the sum of the of, of both. But if we analyze probings and wildfires here, we find uh, contradictory results because we find that uh, the mediation uh, effort for a uh, suffer a flowing and a wildfire has a negative impact. Although uh, and it's important to remark that we find that in those regions who have suffered uh, those firms with, which are in a region that has suffered a wildfire also uh, have a positive direct impact, but the, the mediation impact is bigger, so they don't introduce uh, environmental innovations. So as some preliminary discussions of these results, I have to say that we find a direct uh, impact of climate change on environmental innovation, although it's true that the, the, the size of the effect is small, but it's uh, in line with uh, what previous, uh, previous literature have found for other European countries. But the most difficult part to explain uh, right now is why we find some mixed results of this mediation uh, effect. Because we have found that in heat waves, the, um, the, the public concern mediates the, the climate change impact on, on, environmental, on, on environmental innovation, but this effect is not always uh, when we are talking about stream events. So here I think that the main reason of this mixed result is how we measure the mediator variable because we, we have measured the, the variable as the share of respondents in each region who consider environmental issues to be among the two most important issues. So although we control for, uh, for time effects, I think here we are having, we are dealing with, with a problem. And so the further steps mainly is to explore this uh, negative mediation effect conduct some uh, sensitive uh, sensitivity analysis and to test the model with other controls, mainly at regional level. And the, uh, ideally, it will be uh, the next step, we will try to analyze other European countries in which the um, environmental concern uh, will be bigger or will be uh, higher, and then it, analyze if there are any heterogeneity in Europe. But this is a problem because right now community innovation survey only offers data at not say one level uh, or at a national level. So then mainly the best way to analyze and to approach this uh, at a bigger level, at the European level, will be introducing some uh, patent data. So that's all for my side. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Enrique. Comments? Questions? Just go ahead. So this was great. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, so, um, so my, my, my main issue, I don't understand why are you using, I may, I may have misunderstood the model, but why are you using a kind of cross-sectional model? In the model that as you are using it, as far as I can understand, you can get the difference between regions. So, uh, but the point is that uh, if the, you are not measuring actually what you want, which is the difference within the same region in when before and after there was the, 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 the street event. Yeah. So I think you should do a different indifference analysis here because you have the regions in which there is a kind of uh, street event and those in which not. So you can compare them over time so you can have the variation within time because otherwise there is a, a, a big issue here, which is that maybe and the regions in which they had in those years, a kind of climate change event, are, are the ones in which there is always this kind of event because that these events are not random. So there, there may be a problem, which is is not is, is the fact that they are in these kind of regions that is kind of they are more affected always by climate change that is increasing the, the issue. So I think like you should get kind of within variation, and with that you have a it's amazing. I mean the organization was great. I really like it. So let me uh, ask you. So the things that I not focus on the the regional environmental innovation outcome, rather than in the at, at firm level. So 
uh, as you said, there are could be some uh, um, effects at regional level that will be over time, but yeah. Yeah, but still, if you are doing different level, you also want to do that. Yeah, maybe I have to control, at, uh, also introduce the controls at a regional level in the second equation. Second one. Uh, the yes, but that wouldn't solve my big concern. But yeah. Okay, we can. Okay. Okay. And just two very fast questions. The first one is that uh, it's in some sense, uh, I give you back the question you asking me, are you using only local firms because uh, firms could be located in different uh, yes. regions or could be international be affected by other things? And the second question is uh, the, uh, 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 it's more a suggestion, no? because in the second equation, the probability model, and you cannot include uh, regional variables because you have, I think, but the question is, could, could you aggregate firms and have something like percentage of firms that uh, uh, perform environmental innovation? Uh, yeah, in the previous. And yeah. have a panel or something like that, uh, in, instead of using uh, if the firms have or not have a, uh, environmental and innovation, just what's the percentage of firms that within that in the region? region and reform. So you have a continuous level, but that's a suggestion just to, to score. Yeah, so answering your last question, yeah, I think that I should explore that variable that you suggest. And answering the, the first one, the thing is that to, to find the first location, we focus on the uh, Spanish region in which they invest more in terms of air and B expenses. So we don't focus where the in where the headquarters location, where they're in where else in where are the main uh, facility or the, the the region in which they are uh, spending their R and D funds. So you have to think about that because if the headquarters are in, in one region that suffer. Uh, but there are many problems the decision and may affect another, uh, yeah. another region or this sort of effects. And maybe you can uh, have a spatial autocorrelation also. Yeah. Uh, that's that's suggestive. Well, okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Enrique. I think it's a very nice uh, model. The, the shame about the results uh, that's that's the problem. Uh, but what is an environmental innovation? Uh, um, environmental innovation is an innovation with uh, introduced by the firm with the objective or reduce the climate, uh, the, the environmental. And um, this being uh, the community innovation survey should be self defined. Yes. And uh, how reliable is that indicator by firms? Yeah, it's the, the problem that they answer, the, the manager of the firm answer the question. So you also have some. Uh, um, problems when they are asking about the self, but talking about uh, this variable has been widely used in, in, in innovation studies and also in environmental studies. Um, yeah, so uh, fine. If you're confident of that, it's good. Uh, the only thing is I like your model. You have the right controls at the regional level. You have the right controls at the firm level. And then you just produce the results uh, about um how let's say extreme weather episodes actually affect uh this innovation but are the controls at the regional level and at the firm level do they have the expected sort of uh, uh effects yeah. so because that that will be good to see you yeah okay yeah i can share with you that. no no i mean it's, it's, it's important that, so you're confident that so Let's say younger firms innovate more. Uh, yeah, those is... who cooperate, uh, collaborate with, uh, let's say, doing and using partners. Does that do all right? So if you have all that and it works, that's fine. Yeah. So then the problem for you is mainly that your results don't go in the same direction. So how do you go about doing this? Uh, because on the one hand, you have yes, the heat episodes they lead 
to more environmental innovation, but if you have floods and wildfires, they don't. What is the logic behind that? So how do you get out of this conundrum? Because that, that is really undermining your capacity to produce a paper. So either you make sure that they go in the same direction, or you can focus on one of the indicators, the one that's probably the most used, because otherwise the situation that you have right now is that, uh, well, it depends on what type of, um, uh, let's say extreme weather episodes that it has an impact. And then the question that I think Juan Jose was asking is, who makes the decisions about environmental innovation? And uh, do you, are these branches of firms and are the decisions taken somewhere else? So if you have a heat wave in London and that London firm has branches in, in Spain, where there might not be heat waves or there might be even small stream. So is that something that they react? And it's not necessarily spatial or the correlation. It's just a question of what sort of distances, what sort of mechanisms of decision you have within firms or groups of firms. But anyway, I think we need to move forward because otherwise we're not going to have time to have dinner. So thank you very much once again. And now we go to our next presentation, in which is uh, Jose Joaquin Luque Garcia, who is uh, in economic history from the University of Malaga. So he's going to be talking about the technical press specializing in gas uh, and how does it work. So let's go ahead. So thank you very much for the presence, for being here. And Mr. Rodrigo, we talk for your space. Uh, I'm going to explain what I'm doing in my thesis. I only have been researching this, this, this thing uh, uh, for eight months. And uh, right now I am a very, in the very beginning of my researching. What well, I'm going to explain uh, the technical best specializing in gas uh, during the mid uh, 18th, 19th century to the mid 20th century. For that, I'm going to do a, a brief uh, introduction to its to story. Uh, gas industry was one of the focal points of the industrial development during the 19th century. Also, it was one of the axes of the urban development by lighting the great avenues that uh, was uh, arose, arousing at, the, at that time. We can see here the Group Cartes in Paris by lighting by gas, but also as the industry developed, uh, the gas uh, increased its uses by uh, implementing it in the cooking, in heating, also in the industry as a motive power. But what is gas? Uh, gas is a term which was created by Jean Baptista in 1644. Uh, through the term to the, to the Greek term chaos, when he was studying the carbon dioxide. After that, the meaning of gas uh, had uh, become generally used to all the gases. Here in our study, the gas uh, we focus on is the, the gas which is capable of making combustion. In the framework uh, I am studying, uh, the the manufactured gas uh, from coal uh, will be the, the hegemonic uh, gas in this epoch. After that, uh, natural gas, also the petrol gases like panobutano, will be will take its place. And gas, uh, flammable gases, uh, has been known uh, from the ancient times, but uh, it was an until the end of the 18th century when uh, two persons independently uh, were capable to create a mechanism to extract the gas from coal or from wood with uh, the possibility of implement that gas in the industry. Nevertheless, Le Bon died uh, very early and Murdoch only used uh, its invent to isolated establishment. It was a German person, uh, Winsett, which it will be called Windsor here in England, which implemented the first uh, supply network uh, in the world. He was working here in London, and in his experiment, he 
he met for the first time in the world the uh, IS3 by gas in Panama. After that, he created the Gas Lighter Co Company, which was the first company also in the world. After that um, uh, company uh, in England, the growing up of this industry was very quickly. And by the time that uh, the first company in the continent was created here in England, 12 cities uh, was, were, were lighting by gas. In Europe was uh, Bru Bruxelles, the first city uh, in half of the lighting. After that, Paris. In the 20s, uh, the Central Europe. In the 30s, uh, Milan. And also in the 40s, the periphery of Europe, like Nor Norway, which was in that time uh, with Sweden, and also the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, without a movement of knowledge and technical transfer, uh, the knowledge and technical transfer, we can understand this expansion of the industry. Uh, the ways that technical transfer uh, takes are varied. We can name the direct uh, capital investment. For example, the Imperial Continental Gas Company was British and was created for uh, establishing in the continent, also by the uh, patents and pursuit of patents. Study tours, for example, in Spain, the first demonstration of gas was made by a person who was granted by the government of Spain for studying in French and bring to the country the new technology, also by scientific ladies and also for the uh, work carried out for the, sorry, for the universal civilization, and also for the work carried out for the professional societies, which was uh, created from the 60s in the 19th century. We are going to focus in the labor of the technical press in that uh, knowledge transfer. Before uh, the technical specialized press was created, the scientific and technical advance was uh, complained in general scientific press. Those uh, general scientific press were uh, born in the 18th century with a enlightening uh, wave of view and they were general. It wasn't until the gas industry uh, acquired a uh, significant importance when we find the first uh, gas journal, who, it couldn't be otherwise, was created here in London in the uh, most developed uh, industrial place uh, in Europe, in the world. And here in this number, this journal and uh, the same if that is not going to last even a year, but we can find in, in it the, the aims that will have the rest of the journals, which will be uh, create a community of knowledge, uh, of a technical community, which connect all the professionals, all the people interested in that industry, and also makes union for uh, take uh, power and between another agents like um, um, uh, governments or local governments. There is a phrase I have uh, highlighted here, which says uh, Thomas Pablo, Josh Pablo, the inventor of this journal, uh, let it be remembered that knowledge is power and union is strength. After this, uh, his nephew will create another journal which will be success until the 1970, the Journal of Gas Lighting. The in French, in Paris, the great the Journal de l'Eclairage au Gas, Gas and Wonder Times, in London, Le Gas, also in German, and also in America. This family uh, continued uh, growing up during the 19th century, and I really love this drawing in American Gas Light Journal, because it shows us the mentality and the network they were building uh, almost uh, family-like. In this uh, drawing, we can see the 
first important journal, the journal of us like me, like I like a pater familia, and the subsequent uh, journals at the child. In the article, we can see also how they uh, talk uh, among them. The family uh, grow up and we can find in the time I'm studying and all those journals which make us uh, uh, think where are the functional limits of our study. Uh, historiographically, uh, the journals have been used as a source for the industrial of gas history, but they have never been studied at, at an object itself. We can find in the book of Hathaway an appendix in the end in which he make a list of the journal he knew, but it's a great point for a start, but they have many lags and also many errors that I'm trying to fix and, and little by little. And also we have some uh, references in Thomas Russell, just one page uh, saying the importance of uh, gas journals in the industry. Also in Spain, we have Alayo Manubensa Barca Salon, which make in a, in a study of general press, a little introduction to why the, uh, specializing press and born. And finally, Fernandez Parada, which is my supervisor, uh, make an introductory study of the journal Lucinagas, which was created by the Société Technique de l'Industrie du Gas en France, and it will be the most important gas journal in the continent. Uh, and it is publishing uh, nowadays by the name of Gas de Jocret. My research question in this is what was the role gas journal in knowledge transfers in Western Europe in the manufacturer called Gas Era? Also, from this question, we can uh, take as many questions as we can. Uh, how many journals were published? Where are the, the characteristics? Which actors were involved in those journals? Entrepreneurs, engineers, technicians, scientists, governments, companies. I also have found recently that workers in the end of the 19th century will create its, uh, their own journals for uh, strike and for um, work movement. Did the journals operate as lobbies? What role did the journals play in the construction of a collective identity and memory? And how did they deal with the competition, competition with other sources of energy, like electricity? And what was the relationship with economic actors? Uh, with that, we try to catalog in gas journal uh, right now, which is what I'm doing right now. In all days, I'm in the British Library taking the journals they are here. Uh, also, studying the, how was the technology transfer, how spread, how was spread by this way the, the advance. Identify the actors involved in the journals, but not only its names, we want to know who they were personally, but also to try to study in a photographic way. Uh, the, the names, the people who work in these journals. Also anal analyze the subject subjectivity, the, 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 ideology, the motivation and intention of these actors, and identify the structure and network of the knowledge tran transfer through the journals. Which problematic we have? First of all, the broad chronology, which I said before, uh, right now I thinking about if I have to reduce uh, my, the time in a study or, or whether I have to short the journals and study. Maybe I can study some of them in a general way and the, the most important ones, one or two, uh, studying them and try to use them as a paradigm of the knowledge transfer to them. Also the spatial dispersion of this journal and there are not uh, journals digitalized, digitalized in the internet, only the journal of gas lighting and American gas lighting are digitalized right now. So I have to move in these eight months. I've been in Barcelona, in Sabadell, in Madrid, now in London. I have to go to Paris, to Brussels to try to find the journals. That takes a lot of time. 
and also a lot of money. And also, I have a, such a big problem, which is the absence at this moment of administrative information from the journals. If the, some of the journals have been disappeared, some of them have um, a big uh, lacks of, of issues. I, for example, the Gas and Water Times, I don't have the third issue, which is probably the, one of the most important because they have the reason for starting. And more difficult is to find this administrative uh, information which will give me information about uh, subscriber list, supplies, staff, uh, company agreements. And, and because of this absence, I have to go to another sources like proceedings, academic records, and biographies, congresses, local press, and general technical press. The methodology I'm, I'm going to do, first of all, is the compilation and cataloging of the journal, which is where I right now. After that, I'm going to do a qualitative uh, uh, method um, for studying the content of these journals and to know what are, uh, which are the possibilities, identify the actors and study its life. And after that, I want to make a quantitative uh, methodology, which is the social and network analysis. The social and network analysis uh, starts uh, with uh, the sociology in the 30s, in the last century. And it is in this in the beginning of this century when it's, when it's began to be used in history and in humanities. In Spain, we have two monographics, which um, gave us a uh, uh, notions of how to use this model. And um, basically, the social network analysis is a structured approach to social research, to social research, including graphical techniques, metrics, and a statistical method, who allow us to analyze uh, the, the position of these actors and how uh, they are relations, how these actors are relations between among them. The research possibilities we gave us this social network analysis is to know the actor position, uh, the central, the central of the actor, uh, the overall network connection. If the transfer of knowledge was uh, high between journals, between countries, between journals and enterprises, and also know how was the actor grouping. If there were uh, like groups of knowledge. Uh, independent ones of all. And with that, I have uh, already finished. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jose Joaquin. Questions? I have a, a question if, uh, if I can. Yeah, go ahead. Um, thank you for your presentation. It's, it's really interesting to have a point of view, an historical point of view of uh, knowledge transfer. I was thinking that I don't know if it, it if it's useful for you, but probably it could be interesting to um, to put into the analysis the data on patent. Uh, because I was I, I was thinking about it when you uh, in the very when you presented the very last slide uh, about the network network connection maybe to see if uh, in some geographic areas uh, where a, a specific journal uh, uh, when where there was access to a specific journal if there is a, like a relation with the patent registration or patent application of uh, uh, of innovations related to to gas uh, so. This might be interesting uh, yeah, yeah, for, to see. For sure. Uh, one of the things I have noticed, these uh, journals not only um, show the patterns and uh, they are in that moment, also show the patterns who have been uh, created before. And also they are uh, places where the engineers or the entrepreneurs fight because of that patterns. Sometimes they fight because uh, one of them uh, accuse another of blacklisting um, uh, or uh, something like that, and it would be a study for sure. I don't know if I if I will make a list of all of them, 
if that would be useful in my study. Hopefully, I will focus on that uh, communication uh, because of the patterns, the fights, the disputes, the, the argues. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Not, I'll just go very quickly on issues. I think that's an interesting topic. It's, it's outside my area of uh, research, but uh, very interesting. The question here is, you have a lot of description and then you go to the research question, which is a very valid question. So does the presence of this journal facilitate knowledge transmission in the gas industry in, uh, in Europe? But uh, it's not your only question. You have like five or six other questions below, uh, which pull you in all directions. Is this a lobby group? Is a, so I know that you are an economic historian. You probably want to write a book. So you might have several questions. But uh, how do you relate the questions? And how do you prevent this from going in all directions? Questions? Well, I don't know, but I think in in history we have to make uh, many questions about the topic we are studying. The first one, the main one, was the role of uh, was was the role of class journal in the knowledge transfer. Um, that role could be. Uh, um, a, a general meaning. So for that, I think I'm going to have an old question and even more. Uh, the aim is to make a, 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 a network of who was in this uh, uh, knowledge transfer. Yeah, yeah. How do you we, don't have, we don't have a lot, a lot of time to this. My, my advice is you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight questions. Um, if you're going to do this, my advice would be one question, one paper. If you're going to do a book, one question, one chapter. And the, the questions have to be clearly separated because otherwise uh, you might interfere with one another. Then the second question is a bit related to what Constanza was saying. In innovation studies, we say the diffusion of innovation comes through tacit knowledge, not through, through tacit knowledge, not through codified knowledge. Tacit knowledge is the one that happens mainly through non-codified mechanisms, face-to-face -face interaction, being there, being at the right place. Um, once it appears in a newspaper, it's all news. The comparative advantage comes in at the beginning, before everyone knows about it. You gain at the stock exchange because you do things before the others. Once you put it in the newspaper, that's it. It's yesterday, yesterday's news. So how are you going to leverage this difference between the codified knowledge, which is what you have here in the, in the newspapers, and the tacit knowledge, which is the one you cannot observe, but you might be observing through who talks to whom and perhaps within a social analysis, social network analysis. That's, I think it's... Uh... A limit of social network analysis because uh, if two persons was in the same city, for example, uh, and I don't have a, a, a setting or a journal who told me they were together, can I know they talk each other? Can I know they were related? You you don't have to you don't have it in the in the in the newspapers you're analyzing, but you might have another. Yeah. And in innovation, there's a lot of social network analysis saying. Is it physical proximity? Is it institutional proximity? Is it social proximity? Is it ethnicity? So if two people are from the same place, even though they might be far away, they might are much more likely to collaborate than if they're not, or if they work in organizations that are related. So there are a lot of there's a lot of work on innovation that would tell you that. Okay, but let's uh, move on. So thank you very much. And since we want to end up having dinner later on, so Yu Ying, your turn. So it's now Yu Ying Yu, who is from the Department of Management, Strategy and Innovation at KU Leuven. So please go ahead. So 
I'm going to introduce the, the, uh, this presentation. It's my research paper. The topic is the diversification of the policy support that enables of specialization in climate technologies at the regional level. So the idea of this paper is from the uh, European Green Deal and with the two main targets. Uh, the one is the uh, uh, reduction in um, greenhouse gas emission and the other is the energy transition. So to repair these two process, uh, the core is the climate change mitigation technologies because this kind of technologies cover a variety of technology areas including the greenhouse gas related, the information related and the transportation related technologies. So to help to achieve this goal of European Green Deal, we try to um, uh, we put forward our research question here is uh, how to develop a green, uh, how to develop climate technologies in European regions. And then I do a really brief summary for this paper. So uh, we use uh, review the advantage technology index to check a dynamic uh, uh, evolution of climate technologies, uh, including the intensification of specialization in climate technologies, and also the emergence of new specialization in climate technologies. And also, we examine the law of regional characteristics of technological distribution um, through two types of diversification, uh, including related diversification and unrelated diversification. We are also examining the moderating laws of ex external policy instruments from multi level. Uh, regions, uh, including regional, national, and the EU regions, and to support uh, the laws of internal regional characteristics. So this is uh, our theoretical framework. Uh, you can see the two main strains. The one strain is uh, the rate the diversification is linked to the intensification of specialization in climate technology. The other stream is the uh, unrelated diversification is linked to the emergence of new specialization in climate technologies. And uh, also three moderators uh, for different level regimes uh, release different uh, uh, moderating laws. And for the theoretical part, we first identify two dimensions of specialization in climate technologies. So, so we use uh, this kind of uh, indicators uh, um, because uh, uh, it can not only reflect the existing competitiveness uh, of technology capabilities and also um, um, reflect the, the development the potential of technology te uh, climate technologies. And then we, uh, from the theory of economic geography, um, we consider this intensification of specialization in climate technologies can be considered a past dependence. So in this process, uh, regions more rely on the uh, previous technology capabilities and, uh, and try to improve technology capabilities through learning by doing. And uh, innovation research points out uh, this process is parallel to the knowledge exploitation and uh, incremental innovation, and um, in which uh, regions can reinforce uh, existing knowledge system. And for the emergence of new specialization in climate technologies, uh, the economic geography theory point out uh, uh, it's more like a, a path creation. Because in this process, the previous uh, uh, technology pathway is, reply, is replaced by the new one that possesses a greater uh, competitive advantage in a dynamic context. So, and also the innovation research points out uh, is uh, uh, this process is parallel with uh, knowledge exploration and also radical innovation with the acquisition of new uh, technology capability and then new knowledge production. So 
Then we uh, identify and distinguish two types of diversification uh, according to the readiness uh, costs, the diversity technology fields, or within technology fields. Uh, we divide diversification into rated diversification and unrated diversification. Um, we suppose the relationship uh, between the rate up related diversification and the intensification of specialization in primary technologies because the uh, complementary combinations developed by related uh, technologies uh, imply a kind of a synergy um, of related resources which can improve the, um, further exploitation of knowledge and technology. And uh, so, uh, then uh, for innovation part, uh, we uh, argue that increment, incremental innovation is more likely to occur in regions characterized by rated diversification uh, and uh, uh, rated technologies with really high cognitive proximity. So based on this, we put forward our first hypothesis, uh, rated diversification is more likely to positive world factor. Uh, the intensification of specialization in primary uh, technologies. And uh, for the second hypothesis, uh, uh, we uh, we know unrated diversification with a really low cognitive proximity and the technolo technology proximity. This allows for less overlap of regional technologies, which is more likely to improve technology breakthrough. And also, as unrated diversification is accompanied by the create, uh, creation of new technology funded by um, heterogeneous uh, technologies and technologies, such diversification is more likely to uh, increase the radical innovation. So, based on this, we put forward the second half thesis. Is unrated diversification uh, positive affects the emergence of new specialization in primary technologies? Then we focus on three moderators. So uh, most studies focus on one dimension of policies, uh, holding, um, which pays less attention to the heterogeneity between the political regions. So instead, in this, uh, in this study, we uh, policies from different regions. Uh, uh, so as moderators uh, to uh, that depend on local existing technology status to well manage innovation activities from the angle of resources. For the first uh, uh, moderator, we um, use uh, local uh, the attitude of local dominant party towards the environmental protection to indicate the power policy support uh, from the regional level. Uh, we argue lobbying activities and uh, 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 by uh, local, local political parties use uh, lobby activities uh, to encourage more collaborations between multiple actors like uh, institutions, uh, organizations, and uh, or something other actors uh, to invest in more for climate technologies. So in this, in this way, we highlighted that uh, uh, positive moderating effect of uh, local policy support. But uh, it's really uh, important to notice that uh, the political uh, party's uh, power is really limited. And you cannot work as uh, moderators uh, to assume the radical technology challenge. So we argue a uh, significant um, moderating effect of uh, local um, policy support. And for the national level, and we use the national environmental regulation to indicate uh, the um, policy support uh, from the national level. Um, so such a regulation put more pressure on local organizations uh, which we discourage the organization's motivation to invest more for R&D expenditure of climate technologies. And also national regulation schemes cannot offset the resource shortage that occur when 
diversification is a positive effect uh, on innovation and uh, am amplified the, the um, deficit in diversification in this process. So we suppose the negative moderate effect that is uh, um, that underpins the diversification effect on the specialization in climate technologies. And the final one for EU level, we use uh, European regional um, de uh, development fund to indicate the policies about toward the climate change issue uh, from EU region. And we notice that the allocation of this program uh, really take uh, multi objectives uh, like uh, uh, unemployment, uh, education in level, and uh, technology capability across different regions uh, try to reduce the disparity of uh, uh, regional um, technology com competence. So in this way, uh, it can be offset the limitation of diversification to the specialization in climate technologies. So we argue that uh, the positive moderating effect of EU policy support. And then moving to my storage part, we take uh, we focus on 203 NAS2 regions across 28 EU countries. And uh, from the period uh, uh, 2006 to uh, 2018, uh, we use uh, OECD pad, uh, expert patent data and uh, focus on three digit CBC technology classification uh, to measure the dependent variables. We use uh, RTA index to measure the intensification of specialization in climate technologies. So I show in this equation I represent the NAS2 region, P is the year, uh, and the S is different three-digit CPC classification. And for the different uh, that was uh, for the different uh, dependent variable, the emergence of new specialization in climate technologies, uh, we set up a three-year window uh, for the year of this period is uh, it's below 1.5, and at the end year of the period, it's about 1.5. Uh, we argue there's a new specialization in climate technology in this region in this period. Otherwise, there's no new specialization in climate technologies in this period. And then we use uh, HOD the index to measure uh, these two types of uh, diversification, also based on patent data and the number of patent application uh, to measure these two diversification. And also to mitigate the intergeneity issues, we uh, use uh, uh, RV based on non-climate technologies. Um, how to do you identify this uh, RV and the non-climate technologies? Uh, we focus on non uh, we focus on co-occurrence co ratio about 1% between other three digits CBC and Y02 CBC to identify those technologies that might affect specialization in climate technology in a direct way or uh, indirect way. So we already found uh, 46 three digit CBC uh, classification that uh, co occur with uh, Y02, that means this uh, uh, patents cover this uh, 46 uh, three digit CDC classification have a really high interdependence with climate technologies so Y02 uh, classification. So we major RVs uh, uh, excluding this uh, patent application cover this uh, 46 three digit uh, CPC categories and uh, they re we just reuse the remaining 18 CPC classification. And then for the three moderators, uh, we use the consistent percentage of the dominant uh, party of um, policy involving environmental protection. Uh, based on the manifesto data set to major the uh, policy from the regional region and use the ratio of environmental tax per capita to gross um, regional product uh, per capita to measure the policy from the national region. And the final one use the, the amount of ERDF expenditure as a share of 
GRP to measure the positive value in you. And we construct uh, two models here. Um, and we, for each model, we include some country variables, uh, such as the population density and the educational uh, attainment and the knowledge stock. And also include the year fixed effect, the immediate fixed effect. And for the first model, we use a two year lag between the dependent variable and the dependent variable. And moving to the result part. Uh, so for these two, uh, tables, uh, we can see the first color and the second part color, we use uh, different uh, fixed effects and uh, the third color, we use uh, the IVs. And so for the first uh, model, uh, we found uh, related diversification can positive affect uh, intensification of specialization in climate technologies and uh, national policy support uh, can uh, negatively moderator uh, the relationship between related diversification and uh, uh, intensification of specialization in climate technology. And for the emergence of new specialization in climate technology, we confer oriented diversification can positively affect, affect the uh, emergence of new specialization in climate technology and uh, national policy su support uh, will negatively uh, moderator the relationship between our rate diversification and the emergence of new specialization in climate technology. And uh, uh, this paper has some um, notice and the contributions. Uh, first, we employ two dimensions of technology specialization that are reflect the existing uh, technology capabilities of regions and the dynamic evolution by uh, climate technologies. So we parallel two dimensions of specialization in climate technologies to different types of innovation and different types of technology pathway to fill out an intersection between the theory of economic geography and the innovation research. And we also provide some insights for how to develop a climate change uh, climate technology for both internal and external streams. Uh, we distinguish the laws of different types of technology distribution uh, in two dimensions of technology specialization. And we also couple political research to economic geography research. We articulate the heterogeneity uh, of policy from multi level regions toward uh, climate change issue. Now, we also identify a clear moderating law of policy support and that allocate the laws of internal technology characteristics to maximize climate technology development in EU regions. And then, Can we wrap it there? Because if we have... The last one, the last one. Yes. And then we have some discussions uh, uh, to explain the, our results and uh, also uh, some policy implication. So uh, the first uh, policy implication in, in parallel with the uh, European Green Deal uh, policy instruments uh, from the national government the clear deserve further attention. So we need to be aware of the interaction between the string stringency of environmental tax and the local technological rate, the combination competence. And also we suggest that uh, Decentralization makes a difference in technological development in EU regions. And also, the local government needs more resources and powers for the development of technology, uh, climate technologies. And we also uh, suggest that place based uh, policy support proposed by research and the innovation of smart specialization. Uh, strategy can be used as a more efficient uh, policy instrument uh, to pay the emergence of new climate technologies. And also, some, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Yu Ying. So, any questions? Yes, go ahead, Hal. Thanks for an um, interesting presentation. I really enjoyed um, your research. Um, like, um, I, if I remember well, your research investigated facts facts of related or unrelated yes. regional diversification on further in further specialization or or new specialization right this is yes, yes, yes. and 
it is it's, it's, it's like a territorial innovation models like um i have I have, I have several questions the first one is but one question oh yes but the main, <laughs> the, the main question is whether you consider collaboration between the influence of collaboration between regions like um Hans said like uh, influences the the, the the flow of knowledge on your regional on the regional that specialization or, or did, did you consider the the, the, the um labor mobility or the, the like the, the mobility of, of, of human capital from other regions into your region or move out from your regions that, yeah. that's my main question Thank you. Very interesting question. I think, uh, uh, yes, uh, the mobility of regions also important uh, uh, factor for that uh, specialization in climate technologies. But our storytelling is more focused on within regions. This technology distribution could improve these regions uh, specialization in climate technologies. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Well, uh, one question from me. Yujing, what is your main contribution? What is it that you add that's new to the literature on related diversification? Apart from the fact that we all know that uh, related variety leads to more intensity, unrelated leads to breakthrough. Mm -hmm. So what do you add new? You knew it's towards the climate technologies. There's no uh, existing studies uh, to link these two uh, different uh, fields, uh, economic geography fields uh, to innovation fields. So we use so, climate technologies. Yeah, but are you just, just adding, no one has done climate, but if everyone has done the same with other things and they get the same results, what is doing it to another sector? What is the novelty? This is what you have to think about. Um, so you mean the novelty just at all is in the climate? The novelty can all just be, I'm just adding a new sector. I'm mm -hmm. just doing climate or I'm doing digital transition or I'm doing, mm -hmm. you have to think really what is that you contribute? Mm -hmm. As beyond saying I'm doing- Practical implication you mean? No, it's uh, mainly what is the break breakthrough? Mm -hmm. What is your main contribution in one sentence that you have to tell me? Literature. No, main contribution to our knowledge. Knowledge. And just uh, uh, use this climate change, this topic to figure out the uh, theoretical part between the economic geography and the innovation research, well, linking the technology distribution to that uh, technology capability and uh, technology pathway. Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay, so general comments on this presentation because we have to go. Uh, this is in general for everyone. When you have 15 minutes, you have to really focus. And uh, you cannot come with a presentation that has 200 words per slide. I do presentations and I do presentations to, you have to really think about what is your message. Most of my presentations rarely have more than 10 words per slide. So try to do that. And you have to focus on several things that have to be clear. First, what is the gap in our knowledge that you're addressing? That's the first thing. And it has to be very, very clear. What is it that you're adding that is really new? What are the main results that are the breakthrough results? You focus a lot on the methodology and try and find that's good when you have a lot of time. You have limited time, go for that. And then what are the implications for society? For society, for firms, in the case of Enrique, for policy making, in the case of most other uh, uh, papers. So in that respect, you have to be very clear. You cannot just go over all this because the problem is then, and this is, I'm not saying in a negative way, what are the messages that I can remember from your dissertations? And uh, sorry, your presentations. And people these days have got small concentration spans. So you have to have a very clear message that we have to remember. And that message has to be novel. 
I mean, it can be incremental, just saying I'm applying this to another sector or I'm using, but you have to be trying to force and saying, I'm doing something that is completely new and this is the main novelty. And you have to hammer that message. I think Juan Jose is the only one that did it at the beginning. At the beginning, so I can remember, and at the end, because what comes in the middle, especially if you have a lot of tables and numbers, no one can concentrate on that. Try to remember that because, I mean, I know that the way, especially in economics, things are going, people want to do a lot of nitty gritty and specific questions. In real life, what people want to say is, what is it that you add new? And how can it help me, let's say, change society? And this is what you have to highlight in these places. All right, so thank you very much for your contributions. We're going to go now very quickly directly to dinner, but to all of you watching on YouTube, this is what you can achieve if you come to the LSE, getting a Miguel Dolls uh, Fellowship at the Canada Blanche Center here. We are going to be advertising in the next few days, uh, almost immediately, the fellowships for the what we call the Michaelmas time. So if you are interested in coming and seeing Patinet's research being done at one of the most prestigious institutions in the world in social science, apply. Uh, I think the deadline is going to be the 15th of June. So you have a few days and please do it and do it quickly. So thank you very much to all that came today to uh, all the presentations and for well, the ones that are here in, in the room, let's go for dinner. So thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your day.